Perry. Now hear those who were involved in making it come to life. Join us as we go. Behind the door. Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Door with the Grey Rooms podcast. I am your host, Brooks Bigley, and with me tonight is the author of Season 3, Episode 3, Mark Taus. Mark has now written three stories that have become Grey Rooms canon. A story called Disconnect from our Season 2, a story called Interminable Buzz, which featured as a preseason episode this season, and now this abomination of a story, which has fast become my favorite. How are you this evening, Mark? I'm good, Brooks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about writing because um, I, I, I love the whole the whole the sort of uh, aspect of that. My wife has banned me from talking about it, so I, I, any, any opportunity <laughs> is, is great for me, to be honest. Yeah, this is a safe space for you that we can talk about all the things. I'm really pleased. <laughs> if we can make this a regular spot, that would be fantastic. Well, I think I'm going to be having you back uh, after this again because how many stories do we have now that uh, are part of the gray rooms with you? I think I've got uh, three more lined up. I think from from memory. Yeah. And that's only this season, right? I mean, you're going to continue that's only with this us. Season. Oh, I haven't even started on season four yet. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Well, you're you're handling half the stories for season four, right? I think. <laughs> that's At least right. that's not in the contract. Some... But... Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. Maybe I'll let you get the contract first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, um, so I, I take it that you're having a rough go at owning that new farm of yours, and the story is uh, is just a way of working through it. Like, how did this story come to be? Yeah, so look, I can't imagine anything worse than, than owning a farm. I and mean, it's just not something for me, to be honest with you. And I was driving past um, a, a field one day, and it was a very remote field, you know, lots of little sort of hay bales in the field. And um, I just thought, I haven't, I haven't written a, a story about a, a, like a, an isolated barn or a farm yet. I thought, you know, what, what could I work around? How, how could I utilize that in a story? So that's how my mind always works. I'm always driving, looking around for things, analyzing people, you know, trying to find a thread. Um, and that's all it takes generally, just, just, just some image um, or a conversation for me, to, for me to start on that process. You know, I, I, I go past these fields and I see these hay bales and I'm thinking, what would happen if a, like a person was wrapped in the middle or something? My mind is weird. It just works in very mysterious ways. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so I just thought I'd put Jack in the middle of this farm. You know, his, Jack's, you know, his, his run of luck through life hasn't been great. And I just wanted to see how far I could stretch that, really. Um, but it, it was, it's, quite a, it's quite a dark, morbid story. But also, you know, I, I like putting these little threads of cursed bad luck in there just, just to sort of implement a bit of humor into the darkness. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was quite a dark story. But that, that's how it all started, just from a little image that I saw just driving around one day. Well, it's such a good setting because, um, you know, being a farmer is very, very solitary life and you have acres and acres around you and you're by yourself. So a lot of That's internal it. stuff is going to be going on with you versus, I guess, maybe being in a city where you're just outwardly conversing with so many people. It's a very, very different lifestyle. It's a very different world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I often wonder, you know, what, what else is, is living in that sort of tall grass? What, 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 else is, what else are they sharing their territory with? You know, that, that, that's just how Twisted My Mind works. But yeah, yeah. Right. Every farm has its secrets. Absolutely. Exactly. The, 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 you know, the, the decrepit barn, you know, falling to par. You know, what, what's, you know, why is it always padlocked? You know, why, why is there always a lock on there? You know, it's all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you can have so much fun with it. I live, um, I don't live in farmland, but I do live outside of a big city center in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and yep. then even past like the suburbs on the outskirt of that. So I'm between kind of the suburbs and the countryside. So there are, there is a lot of um, dairy farming out where I am. And yeah. It's just creepy to know that there's just these massive, massive plots of land. You know, it's private land, so you can't just go traipsing in there. God knows exactly. what's going on. I mean, you can yeah. have all kind of alien visits and harems and who knows. Um, but it's yeah, just rife for, right. for writing horror. So, so then you had, you had the setting based on kind of your interactions, you know, like what you saw you were pulling from, from your life. But ultimately, yeah. then how did you start fleshing out the concept for what would happen and, and, and the character setting. How did that happen? Yeah. So, so the character Jack is, you know, he's, he's not a, he's not a good person, you know, let's put it that way. So 
you know, to, in, to, to some extent, you know, karma, karma plays in pretty well. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it does take some other innocent people along the way. But, um, yeah, so you can tell throughout his entire life, Jack has is, is not been, you know, the, 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 a, a shining example of a man. So I just wanted to sort of use that sort of that history of character, you know, use that aspect of him in terms of, you know, how he interacts with people and essentially just um, just twist that bad luck even further, you know, just just mm-hmm. really see how far we can push him. Um, yeah, so that was really it. I mean, it, it's a very simple premise, but, you know, in terms of the, I suppose, the way that the story arc and, and the sort of the way his past comes back to haunt him, and his events come back to haunt him, it's really not just one episode. It's his entire life coming back to haunt him and finally taking him down. Right. Um... I really appreciate too in your writings. I mean, I, I'm only familiar with the three stories, you know, yeah. that you've done with us, and I know that you write more, and we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, but I appreciate how you kind of you're in that league of people that like, hey, man, the worst monsters are us. You know, you're yes. you seem to explore the human condition and how the evilness that we kind of hide, even like we were saying, like you know, what's hiding on a giant farm, what what's hiding inside people, and you kind of play with letting that out a little bit and then how it affects that person and or how it affects the people around them. I really appreciate that about kind of the way you set up your stories. Do you do that with all of your stories? To be honest, the vast majority, yeah, yeah. I, I do love playing with the human psyche, to be honest with you. I really do. Um, I, I just think it just creates a much more gritty sort of drama um, than purely speculative. But I mean, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I love speculative fiction as well. But Sort of just really sort of mixing that with reality. Um, I, I just I just love doing that. I I love sort of seeing, you know, torturing a person, you know, mentally, and just just seeing how we can sort of like disrupt his his flow of life that has been fine to that point, or you know, it's, it's been under the radar, and all of a sudden we can twist that and you know create all sorts of problems for that person. Um, and it, it's a great way because you know, as you said. Um, a lot of my personality comes through the writing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very much an introvert. So, I, you know, I, in, in terms of conversation, I don't like superficial conversation. I don't like small talk. So this is a chance for me, you know, to sort of really sort of start emphasizing my sense of humor and, and sort of, you know, start, start playing with the reader. And, you know what I mean? I mean, just, just sort of like taking it to, to quite a raw level rather than sort of that very sort of superficial stuff. So this, this, a lot of, most of my writing is my personality shining through, which is probably... Uh, one time worrying but also um you know it's it, it, it's fun you know it's, it's it's my fun my fun aspect of my personality coming through when it, and it works so well i mean i of course i would be afraid if a giant 10 foot monster you know was walking around outside my house but yeah like you said that's speculative fiction so like how would we react if that happened but it doesn't really happen so it's kind of a false fear that we have yeah. it's just we're we're afraid of being afraid whereas yeah. if you if you had written this story about this i don't know serial killer that was just slowly whittling away at my brain while i'm in my home and is torturing me that way that really scares me because that really is based you know in, in truth and in what happens to real people. So you've already, you've already uh, ratcheted up the horror there by, by keeping it kind of grounded in reality. Um, Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I like to sort of, uh, you know, I can say play with people. So, you know, how how can I get this person from A to B? How can I get this normal, rational human being who lives a life, who has a family to point B, whereas point B is the the sort of the, the dark side of him? You know, what, what does, what traumas can I put him through to get him from A to B? God, I sound terrible, don't I? But you know what I mean? It, just in terms of, uh, you know, <laughs> but, but it, it is but because, you know, we, we know it can potentially happen to anyone if there's a right sequence of events, if we're exposed to that sort of right sequence of traumas where, you know, we can either go, you know, one way or the other. You know, one way would be sort of end up rocking in a corner and, you know, crying for mummy or whatever. But, or the other one is, is going on that sort of like that sort of crazy kind of aspect where, you know, everything you've bottled up over the years finally comes out and, you know, through some action that is, you know, diabolical or, you know, I think that's essentially what happens with Jack on the farm, you know, is, is, you know, is, is this cursed bad luck that has been his thread for his entire life. And all of a sudden one action, you know, it results in one action 
that he, you know he wouldn't ordinarily think of you know but right. you know the the drink the the isolation the heat everything has got on top of him but so he's basically taken that journey from a to b you know where now he's he's got death on his hands and you know without you know for spoilers for people that haven't read it but they probably already have um you know he he takes you know a lot of people down including children and you know now he's got to live with that you know so yeah it's it, it's a to b it's always a to b and I, I just love that that journey and taking readers on that journey as well right and, and just to preface you can you can spoil because this is behind the door so if if they're listening to this and they didn't listen to your story first then that's their yeah fault. that's cheap isn't it that would be, that would be really <laughs> so cheap we can it? yeah we can we can talk about everything here um brilliant okay fantastic but, yeah. But yeah, going back to like bringing it back to that human condition, like Jack is not an evil person. He's not a serial no. killer. No, he, he is affected by his own shortcomings and his bad luck. So you're not, you know, enabling him and making us feel sympathy for him per se. But we can you're, you're allowing the reader to follow along with him. Why did he make these decisions? You know, he didn't sit yeah, and plot, plot to kill his wife. This transpired no. because of what? Went, went on between the two of them and you know i'm not excusing it but what she ended up doing with you know the neighbor down the road so. exactly yeah i mean nobody's perfect i mean that, that's the thing no, nobody is perfect everyone has their their little achilles heel that if you if you push you know if you push that button um you know something's going to happen and if if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing through your entire life eventually something will happen that and we've all we're all guilty of that we're all, we're all guilty right. of acting in anger right. from time to time yeah, right. so it, it's just the extent of that and uh, how people can actually control that. Whereas, you know, some people, you know, they can talk about it, you know, they can sit down and they, they can sort of melancholically just, just you know, process, you know, thoughts through the head. Whereas others, it's a case of bottling it up, bottling it up until it just explodes in this, you know, almighty explosion of darkness. But So, yeah, it, it's interesting to sort of see how different people react to different traumas in life, I guess. Right. And that's the horror right there. That's the beauty of it. Like, that's how you're a good writer because you're, you're putting a very real horror into someone. Like, even me, I'm like, well, shit, would I have done the same thing if I found out my wife was cheating and was two months pregnant and was leaving yep. me high and dry? Like, that is great horror because you're presented with like, wow, even someone like me could fall susceptible to this. So Yeah, it, it, take, it takes a person to the limit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, I mean, so this is... That's the great thing about fiction. You, you, there's no, there's no limits to it. There's no restrictions to how much trauma you can put someone through. Um, so yeah, and you know, if if you can, you can speed up that process of destruction. Um, something like that, that that's going to do it essentially, isn't it? You know, I mean, is you know, you're, you're taking something, you know, that should be sacred and etc. And then sort of just, just yeah. So just literally trying to rip his life away very quickly, you know, would result in essentially some form of action um but yeah so yeah it's anyway yeah we, we know what he did so he's, he's, he's a bad lad he's a bad lad but, you know. yes 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 there's, there's no and justifying I'm, that there's no justifying that no whatever but, right right yeah. but it feels like maybe he did i mean he ends up dying but it sounds like maybe to that very very last he was saying he was sorry jack was saying he was sorry as he was dying but i still yeah. feel like he was still blaming the bad luck like like you, it's so cool. You you coin that phrase, that cursed bad luck again. You know, like yeah. I feel like he was not fully coming to grips with what he did. It was more that he just felt like, well, shit, my farm went down, everything's gone, and now there's this too. My cursed bad luck. Instead of absolutely. like, you chose yeah. this, you did this. This is your fault. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think to some extent, maybe he'd got to that point where you know he's he's you know, sort of self-reflection was, um, was very limited. So I think even to the case of that, he didn't get the insurance money, you know, curse it, bad luck, you know, so maybe right. if he got the insurance money, he'd be, he'd be moving on and, you know, sort of, you know, living a brand new life and being able to put it all behind him. Maybe, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, no, no such luck, but curse it, bad luck, you know, that's, that's the, that's his been the story of his life. So there you go. He's, he was never going to get away with it because it's followed him around like a bad smell. He was never exactly. going to get away with it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, just the whole concept that you came up with of like his truths being revealed to him, like whether it, w it really was happening or whether it was a vision in his head of, you know, body parts everywhere and these crops that just miraculously yeah. grew was yeah. kind of was not it's not as it was trivial, but it was it was just ancillary to 
him being presented with the truth of everything. And he's, like I said, he, I don't feel he took responsibility. He was sorry it happened, but he went down thinking, nope, this is just the bad luck. So he really Absolutely. wrote a, oh, he wrote a hell of a story, man. So can I ask you then, you don't look like a horror writer. <laughs> you look no, like I, you should be shaking hands and moving, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars between companies. You know what I mean? Um, oh, I think that's probably the biggest thing still anyone's ever given me that, Brooks, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Jim. Yeah, man. <laughs> hope you get those commissions you, you look, you're working you look, hard you look, for. That's right. You look like a broker or an accountant. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Brooks. Thank you very much yes. indeed. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, I mean, do other people ever comment on that to you? Like, uh, look at you and be like, oh, but you're a prolific horror writer. What's going on? here like what should a horror writer look like well that's the thing and yeah i do get that a lot i mean to be fair because uh, like you said i'm relatively clean cut so you know d- dressed in a suit and um yeah when i meet clients i mean we, we do get in conversation and when they do find out i'm a horror writer the the eyes go wide you know typical stereotypical reaction to, to <laughs> fear and horror and they, they take a step back and it's like you know but it, it doesn't seem to compute with them it, it doesn't seem because i think they're expecting well, I don't know really what they're expecting, but you know. Yeah, I mean, what do what do people um, expect from horror writers? Like you have skulls on your desk, and you write everything in blood. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you've got a little little red stain on your white shirt or something. But <laughs> I think um, I think most people know Stephen King, and uh, but I, I think beyond that, I don't think anybody's really you know knows what what horror authors look like. So that perception is is Stephen, and you know obviously. You know, he's, he's got a he's got a, a bizarre look, so I suppose, to some extent, and I suppose they're they're expecting that same, you know, that same kind of look. Or you've got the other alternative, you know, the sort of greasy herd, you know, sort of, yeah, sort of <laughs> thick, bushy eyebrows. Mm-hmm. You know, got a bit of got a bit of a scowl. You know, maybe walks with a limp or that kind of jazz. Maybe maybe keeps his toenails in his pat lunchbox or something. <laughs> you know, you, you, you've got you've got the, all the different extremes of, of what. But it's, it is quite interesting the, the reaction I get when I tell people I write horror. Um, I, and I think, you know, a, a few people have read my stories, and I think I think they are quite taken aback by it. Um, you know, my, my wife has only read two, but she refuses to read any more. She just she just won't do it. She's she's just she she's the light, and I'm the darkness. And um, you know, she she just and I'm not even allowed to talk about it in the house. To be fair, oh, really? I, actually, that's wrong. That's wrong. I get three strikes, so I get three strikes. So third strike, you know, that's it. You know, if I mention it beyond the third strike, I'm, I'm in trouble. So that's, that's the way the it works in my house. Exactly. Right, yeah, right, pretty much. Right. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Yeah. Now, do you get those three strikes per, per month or is it just, you know, three strikes? I get, I get them per day. I get them per oh, day. Oh, per day. Well, that's not so yeah. bad. So you, well, you got to use those is... first two right away and then just hold on to the third one. It's really hard, die Brooks. It's really hard because <laughs> I, I, I love talking about it. I really do. You know, I, I, I love it. And, you know, like I said, she, she's, she's full of light and she's a different soul to me. So it's, it's quite an interesting dynamic the way that works. But oh, yeah, she's the yin to your yang. That's good. That's good. That probably keeps <laughs> yeah. you that probably keeps you on the straight and narrow so that you're not setting farms on fire or anything, you know, like well, it probably does. Actually, it probably yeah. does. It probably does. Yeah. So I'm not sort of holed up in my room, like, you know, with a, with a candle on and just sort of like, yeah, scrolling <laughs> in my own blood, maybe. But yeah, she, she probably does keep. Yeah, I, I think you're probably yeah. right there, to be honest. Yeah. Well, we, we joke here, but I feel like there really shouldn't – there shouldn't be any kind of archetype for what a horror writer looks like. So you're just living proof that you can look like anything and still write absolutely amazing horror because it's not about – I don't think that literally having skulls on your desk and writing in blood would make you a more effective you know, horror writer. So I don't think so. No, I don't think so. No, I think, I think we've all got the capability to write horror, to be honest with you, but I, it's, whether, it's whether we're prepared to – you know, sort of embrace that, I think, to some extent. But uh, some people are always sort of, um, you know, just, just aiming for the light. Uh, but, uh, but I think t- to, in order to sort of discover that, and, you know, I think you have to embrace the darkness to some extent as well, you know, otherwise, Absolutely. You know, to, just as, a, just as a, a benchmark to some extent. And a sense of humor is so important as well. I think, I, I, I don't think you can write horror without having a sense of humor. I think that would be impossible. If you're flat, um, I just don't think it works. I think you've really got to incorporate what I was saying before, your personality into the story. And I think for horror writers, it's it's it just it's just the perfect avenue for them to to sort of inflict everything they want to say, um, you know, but but are too afraid to in in sort of superficial conversation, you know. It's, so yeah, it's 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 fun. You can have a lot of fun with it, and it's it's great. Yep. Yeah, it's like horror gives you 
um, a, a chance to, to develop commentary on just life in general, because horror is this very strange way that I think that humans use as therapy to work through what we really are afraid of. And Absolutely. horror always seems, it seems to touch on, you know, societal issues constantly. I mean, you can even see how horror develops over the centuries and the decades based on actual social things happening, you know, in real life. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, so, it's, it's, I think horror is, is just, for me, it's just a free pass and it is, and it is therapy. You know, I, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, it, it, this, this helps me come to terms with, um, you know, things I've gone through in life and that they all make it down into the stories, you know, through some form, um, you know, so it, it could be dealing with anything from, you know, sort of depression. It could be dealing with alcoholism. It could be dealing with this. There's all sorts of stuff you can really embrace. And it's, it's the perfect therapy to write your way through it. And, you know, when you get to the end of a story that's, that's really heavy and, and sort of very personal, there's the sort of relief when you get to the end of it. And it feels like you've, you know, it, it just feels like it's been such an important um, sort of interaction to some extent. Um, you know, we, yeah, it, it, it's, it's quite interesting. I won't, I won't go into you know, too much depth regarding that, but it has been great therapy for me. I'll, I'll definitely be the first to say that. Well, then let me, let me ask you, um, when did you first start to embrace horror? Like, how old were you when you were like, I want to write horror, I love horror? Like, when, when did this all come about for you? Well, like, I mean, uh, I mean I, 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 as you know from the bio, I mean, I, you know, I hadn't written a story since, since primary school up until two years ago. Um, but... I remember my first library card. I, I got Cujo, the Stephen King story about the the the, the dog. The dog. Um, so that that was the first book I ever read um, from the library. The first proper book I ever read that wasn't inflicted on me at school, and uh, I, I just loved it. I just absolutely loved it. You know, page to page, just just sat on my bed, just just reading it. You know, I, I think I read Cujo in, in a week, um, and then you know it was a case of right, what's next, what's next, and it was I was insatiable. After that, I was just like, you know, what what else can I what else can I read? You know, and you know when you go through the entire Stephen King collection and you're waiting for the next ones to come in, and it's like you know, so so that that was definitely where I found my my love of horror. And um, you know, I, I was I wasn't a dark person; I was a cheery soul. But there's just something about it. Just something about it. Just the ultimate freedom you get with horror to do whatever you want to do. And um, and then you know, I, I, at school it was a case of, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a maths graduate, so. I, Maths was my thing, and I think I loved maths because it allowed me to solve problems. You know, it, so where life was quite, you know, lots of lots of disarray and chaos. I think math, I, maths was my go-to because it was everything had a solution, and that, that's what I'm very loved analytical. About that. You're an analytical kind of person. Very, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Um, but English was always at the you know the back of my mind, and my English teacher always said. You know, if, if you just, you know, paid a bit more attention, you know, you could be an A student. I never thought anything of it at the time, but that, it's funny how that, you know, three decades later, that those words are still in my mind. And they probably have been to some extent, you know, throughout my my day job, my day career. Um, and, you know, it's, it's always been, I, I, I think I was probably talking to Steph about it one day and she just said, Steph's my wife, you know, why don't you give it a shot? Why, why don't you just go for it? Um, so it was, it was quite impulsive. And, you know, I, I said, right, okay, yep, I'm going to go part-time. I'm going to give it a shot. And that was two years ago. I mean, it's kind of a silly decision, really, because I've got two kids as well. Um, maybe it's sort of quite a selfish decision to, to some extent. Um, but I, I just had something inside me that, that's just been dormant. For, and all of a sudden, it was starting to come alive. And, yeah, so, you know, I think it was just over two years ago, I penned my first story, which was horrible. It was awful. Uh, it was it was it was so violent, so badly written. It was it was the typical, you know, sort of I suppose, yeah, teenage horror thing you'd turn in for for an English class or something like that. It was it was awful. Yeah. Um, but Every, it, it, it gave me an appetite. Somewhere. Everyone's got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah everyone's. Yeah. I think I think at one point this woman had a rear bitten off. But let's give you some example. But um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> ouch um yeah ouch yeah so it, it all sort of started from that and um you know I, I learned over time that horror is much more subtle than that it's it's more of a build-up it's more it's more suspense less gore um yeah so it, and, and more psychological as well so and the good thing about it i've been i've been in sales for 30 years um you know so i picking up on the idiosyncrasies of people and 
you know, their, their, their sort of little little manners and ways. It, all of that has made it into into the stories as well. So I've, I've got a lot of material to work on based on 30 years of experience of, of talking to people, analyzing people, and which I wouldn't have had if I'd have started, you know, 30 years ago. So I suppose to some extent, it's, you know, I've had, a, I've had a break to allow me the time to, you know, sort of build up an experience of life and, uh, you know, interactions with people. And now it's all going down. It's just, there's so much material. I just can't get it. I can't, I can't get enough time to get everything down, to be honest, which is a good problem to have. I was going to say, yes, that's amazing. That's like a great burden to shoulder. (laughs) It is. It really is. Having too many ideas. Yeah. There are too many ideas. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've got a day job. I've got, you know, I've got two kids. So, you know, time to write, finding that time is, 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 is challenging. Um, of course, but, but the good thing is when I sit down, you know, I've always got something to write about. I, I'm so, I'm lucky so far in the fact that I haven't really had any situation whereby I've been struggling to find material. And so, so that's good. I've got to be grateful for that. And I think that balance of, of family work writing, I think it, it's working pretty well. I mean, not to say I would love to do it full time, but of course, I, I, as, as would most people, you know, that, that sort of start in this start on this road but like yeah it it I'm, i've got so much material it's crazy yeah it's it's great that you're you're such this this creative person i understand that you have to plug into the matrix basically and do your day job but yeah to be able to be and continue to be a creative person and i love how you're describing how you use your interactions with people so you're always you know, not that you're analyzing, yeah. right? Not that you're analyzing people, but you're still you're aware of it, and you're researching, and you're 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 feeling the flow between you and other people. And like, I just met someone in line at blah 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 today. So how can I work that into a story? I can see how the greater mind works, you know, with you, and that's a really really cool thing because it shows in your stories. Like, you know, yeah. not to not to jump back too far, but disconnect. Uh, from season two that you wrote for us, like again the 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 humanness behind it, the tragedy in what happened it it was so much more than just horror, I mean it was horror, but it went so yeah. much deeper into i could ju- i i don't know how you you know were inspired to write that story, but I can tell that you definitely vibe off of your interactions with people and how people interact with each other and that helps you with your material so that's really cool to see to see you do you're not just like i'm gonna come up with a crazy monster and i'm gonna scare everybody with this monster i I couldn't do that i i I think i've actually tried to do i've tried to write something purely speculative and and that's where i start to struggle that that's my weakness um you know there has to be some some element of of reality in there for me for, for it to really work and i think you know, from that point of view, there's a lot of great speculative fiction writers that, that sort of write, you know, purely, you know, based on non-reality. But uh, I, I can't do it. I, I really struggle with it. And I, I, I just, without a human element, um, you know, with, without some kind of trauma, without some trigger, um, yeah, I, I sort of, I struggle to, to put uh, put things onto paper, really, to be honest with you. But I, I have got a really say this but she'll never she'll never listen to this um but i have got a client <laughs> that works in this place called the, the happy shoe shop and um so it's called a happy shoe shop and every time you go out go in i mean she's just insanely happy you know insanely happy you know she's she's the, she's the most you know friendliest store you know keeper you, you could possibly hope to meet she's just you know to, to the point of being sort of is she okay? You know what I mean? It's to the point of being like, you know, do, 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 does she need meds now? You yeah. know, but she, she's nuts. I mean, the, the, the teeth come out, the eyes go wide, you know, and it's, it's very bizarre. I mean, you almost expect the skin to fall off and for this alien creature to, to crawl out or something. But, but I wrote a story about her a couple of weeks ago and I had so much fun with that. You know, so the whole story just based on her. It was just, it was just so much fun. It was just, it just stirred me in the face. And I, I've got to write about this woman. I've got to write about her. So, yeah, so that, that was a, a, a recent interaction I had that made it down onto paper. And, um, yeah, so it's fun. But I, I, always, I always, like, in terms of my clients, I always, I always say to them, I, to, to sort of break the ice, so I, I do write horror fiction, so you might make it into one of my stories. So <laughs> I, I, I sort of, in a way, subtly ask their permission, um, you know, yes. and they probably don't think anything of it at the time. Um, but yeah, so uh, quite, quite a few of my clients have made it there as well, but yeah. Just look at someone and say, I'm going to murder you 
in a story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, That's there's been awesome. a lot of that as well. There's been a lot of That's that as great. well, Brooks. A, lo- a lot of middle management have suffered at the hands of me, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually I wrote a, I actually wrote a really good story called, uh, um, what's it called? Just Another Meeting about middle management. Oh, I, I had some fun with that one, I tell you. Absolute, <laughs> right, absolute riot. Yep. Like like you said, we can work through our problems with horror, can't we? It's it's we surely it's can. Absolutely, it's, it is it's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's a great tool. It's a great tool. <laughs> yeah. So so tell me, what did you think of the production of the story? Like you wrote the story, and then you heard your words produced as an audio drama. What what was your thoughts? Did it match what you know what you saw in your head when you wrote it? Like how did you feel? The the first thing I had was that little that little twangy bit of music. Um, yes. the intro, I, and I was in love with that. I thought, yes. absolutely, totally set the tone. It. Absolutely yeah. nailed yes. it. Yeah, it, it was just perfect. It was the perfect sort of, you know, sort of ambiance. Like, and and you, 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 you hear that music, and automatically imagine someone sat in a tractor chewing another piece of straw. It's it's brilliant. Yep. I, I thought it was absolutely like genius, to be honest with you. Yep. And there's some segments in there that that were just fantastic as well. Um, you know, when he's is trudging through the cornfield. You, you can you can smell things. You, you you can feel the heat bearing down on him. You know you can imagine the sweat dripping down his back. So it, it was just a brilliant production, to be honest with you. And I'll I'll never tire of working. You know, with the Greyhounds for that reason. I I just love hearing that extra dimension of the stories. It's, it's just yeah, it puts a big old smile on my face, to be honest. That's great. Yeah, we 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 always toot our own horns here, but JM is just a master at reading the story and then feeling it and then turning that into sound music and then, yes. you know, becomes part of the production. And Jason is just on a tear this season with, with just his new production ideas. And I've yep. just seen him doing things with these stories that have just pushed us, you know, into the upper echelon of, of audio drama. It's, it's just simply fantastic. Not to downplay our other seasons, but... When you keep doing better, you gotta, you gotta acknowledge that, you know. Um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah the, so, the, the sort of podcast aspect, it, it works so well, it really does, mm-hmm. you know. And um, there, there are others that just sort of, you know, that that will just sort of do the narration, but just just the whole the whole ambience, the whole atmosphere, it just it just really sort of like. It sort of when I hear my own stories, even the hairs bristle on the back of my neck, even even though I know mm-hmm. what's going to happen, even though I know what's around the corner, uh, I just I still get excited by them. Of course. Now, now speaking of other podcasts, have you, because you've done something like 100 stories in the last two years, have your stories featured on any other podcasts? Yeah, so we, we've, done, um, we've done quite a few. We've done um, the No Sleep podcast. We've done um, things like the other stories, Tales to Terrify, um, The Dread Machine. Um, so there's been quite a few. Um, awesome. But like... You know, honestly, no, I can't say that, can I? But I, I mean, I, I am biased towards like, yeah, certain ones. But, um, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm familiar can, with can the you, few you that you mentioned. The, can you read between the lines? There? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. There you go. <laughs> that's that's cool. Um, I was gonna say, I, I feel like. Um, because I've, I've listened to No Sleep Podcast since, I don't know, day three when they first yeah. came out many years ago, and I wanted yeah. to say that. Um, I would find that you would be a really good, I haven't been listening as much in the latest seasons just because of the pandemic and everything else going yeah. on, but but I would feel like hearing your story on No Sleep would just be just par for the course. Like you would, you're just a perfect author who can submit that because No Sleep will do monster stories, but No Sleep is also really also kind of into the grain that we're into of uh, exploring humanity itself and the darker side, how we you know, basically are our own monsters. Um, I think you. I think. I mean, I might be speaking out of turn here, but I think the grey rooms is more inclined to sort of latch onto that sort of that very sort of dark psyche. Um, I, I think. I think a, a nice sleep. I think um, the audience is probably a little bit more. I don't know what's the word. Uh, they're probably looking for stories without that sort of really heavy element to them. I think. I mean, I, I'm only going by like. Um, I think one one of the stories I recently did was called A Low Spirit, and it was quite a heavy story. It was quite a dark story. It was a flash, flash fiction piece, and, you know, it, it was about depression. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people from the No Sleep audience weren't expecting something like that. I think they're expecting something a bit more light, fluffy, and entertaining. Um, so the vast majority of re- reviews are really good, but I know a couple of people said, oh, you know, that was that was pretty heavy going. 
Huh? Um, like it was too deep for being like no it was sleep. too deep, you know. But you know, like like I said, you know, I'm a firm believer that there are no boundaries in in horror, and you know, I, I think for the, for the people that enjoyed it, I, I think yeah, you just got to you got to let things slide. To be honest with you, but but yeah, so look, I mean, the, the, the thing is about no sleep as well that because they're so popular, that their turnaround time is, is is obscene. I mean, you know, it can take months to hear back from a story, and you know, I'm I'm a little bit more. I'm very impatient, Brooks. To be fair, I'm I'm, I'm prolific and impatient <laughs> as well, which is a pretty bad, a pretty bad combination, to be honest with you. An impatient um, author, I see. <laughs> look, to, to some extent, yeah, because I I just I just like to like you know get that one signed off, move on to the next one, which right, is a right. big flaw, and I'm trying to work on that. I'm trying to become more patient because I know because I, I I wrote four novellas during lockdown, um, and all of them are out for submission. And I'm, right, and I'm just you really, have so much to say, of course, yeah, yeah, that's there, great. There's a lot, there's a lot going on, absolutely, yeah. But yeah. Um, so, look, but and then the the wait time for novellas is around six or twelve months. So I, I do struggle with that that sort of waiting aspect. Yeah. Um, and like with the with the grey rooms with the with season four, what I'll probably end up doing is submitting maybe sort of you know three or four stories in March, um, and sort of really pushing my look there. Uh, but I know that if I wrote a story now, I would I would struggle to sit in it. Just just being very candid, I would. But yeah, but I, but at the same time, I'm I'm desperate to get some more stuff on the on the gray rooms just because of what you do with it. So yeah. Ah, I think we're desperate to have you because you're so goddamn awesome. So it's oh cheers, Brooks. Thank you. The, the feeling, you the feeling, feeling is very mutual. <laughs> cool. No, I, I do, um, I do love it. Yeah. So. Well, so do you have? This is kind of something I'm always asking, but do you maybe have some kind of pointers because you're you're so into writing and you're just so hungry for just getting the next one going do you have any recommendations to anyone that is also in a similar position either that they're highly creative they just don't know what outlet to go on do you have any recommendations on how people can get their writings out there um all right that's yeah okay so it's a good question um i i would probably just say there's only there's only one way of getting around that and that's just writing just just sitting down and writing just just do it just just you know when i look back to the stories two years ago that i wrote um you know the first few yeah you know, that i do cringe that, that you know i do cringe I, you have to get some of the bile out before you get the good stuff on paper and, and still it you know I'm, I'm, it's constantly learning experience i mean i've got a long way to go i've only been writing two years i've got i've got such a long way to go you know but you know, thankfully, I've I've rediscovered my creativity. I'm only 47, so I've got a few years left yet. Um, but I'd say for anyone that's that's thinking about it, just do it. Um, the more you do it, the better you get. Um, short stories are a fantastic way to to practice the art. Um, you know, because you've got to be concise, you've got to be to the point, and you've got to not use. You know, so not use make your words very efficient in terms of the process to keep it all compact. But short stories are the, the perfect way to to sort of just just unleash. Start at flash fiction, you know, send it out to some beta readers, you know, get some feedback, and just just yeah, just write. I mean that that's it basically. Just write. It's great therapy. It's a great journey. You know, when you when you get that first acceptance, there's nothing like it. And you know, I still get a buzz every time I get an acceptance. You know, hundred stories deep, I still get I still get a big buzz um, from getting accepted. You know, there's lots of good stuff happening next year. Um, so yeah, it, just just write, sit down, write. You know, get through the wall of that first half hour of, of getting up and walking away. Just just make sure you've got a coffee, sit down, and force yourself to write because once you start, you just can't. You, there's, there's there's nothing like it, and um, you just get so involved. It's it's just very difficult to pull yourself away. You know, which is where I struggle. Yeah, you know, once I get on that roll, you know. Then I say, oh, I've got kids. Shoot, shoot, I've got to go to work. You know, once once I get in into that sort of world, um, it's very difficult to bring myself out sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I struggle with that too. I mean, I've got kids, and the pandemic yeah. makes us all have to stay home and school them while I'm working. It's it can get yeah. a bit much. No, I was going to um, say, you know what it's like sometimes as well. Once you you have to leave a story, then you have to get back into that world again. You know, it can take. It can take a good hour or so before you're even ready to write. You know, you, you sort of got to sit down. You got to, you know, go back and get into the character psyche, get into the the, the, the situation again. Um, so it, it can take quite a long time to actually, you know, get back into it once you've pulled yourself out of it. So that, that stopping and starting is is uh, something I struggle with as well. That's what I was going to say. I appreciate that you, especially 
and, and other writers can do that because I don't understand that how it's almost like you got to you're, you're wearing the jacket while you're writing the story you got to take the jacket off for a little bit and go attend to the rest of your life then you got to yeah. figure out how to put the jacket back on again and get right back into that mode so I have really I, I have great um, admiration for people who can constantly do that you know when like you said when you're in that mode to write that story that kind of becomes what you're the world you're in in that moment right so you're absolutely constantly, yeah you're in and you're, you're out living of it. different parts yeah yeah you're, yeah, you're yeah. Living so it. And if you're writing more than one story, holy moly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's almost sad when you have to pull yourself out of it as well. You know, I, I do get a bit of grief when, when I have to pull myself away from a story sometimes. You know, you know something that like you're really engaged in and, you know, and, 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 and the flow is coming and you're in the zone. I, you know, I, I do get quite sad when I have to pull myself away. I mean, that, that's why lockdown was quite fruitful for me, you know, because I, I just had that extra time to sit down, you know, lock myself away. And the, the words just flowed. They really did. Um, I, I could never... I've got huge respect and admiration for people that can write a novel over a course of a year, you know, with everything else in their lives going on. I, I really would struggle yeah, because, you know, that's 365 days you've got to plug back in to, to the experience and, and try and come up with the – I, I, would, I would struggle with that. I really would, to be honest with you. Um, so full, full credit to anyone that can do that and do it successfully. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we're getting to the, to the tail end here of our conversation, but I wanted to make sure that, um, you can tell listeners, you know, wh where to find, uh, your stories, the books that you've released. I know that you had a, a recent one that just came out. Um, wh yeah, where so can we find you? Like what platforms, what social media, where are you at? Where are you, where are you showing everything? Yeah. So like you, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, um, you know, I'm on Facebook as well. Uh, check out my, my Amazon page as well. There's, there's quite a few bits and pieces on there. So my only, my only solo collection so far is face the music that was launched, um, last year. Um, but you know, there are some big anthologies like midnight in the pentagram from silver shamrock has just, just come out. Um, spawn from IFWG is coming out next year. The half that you see from dark ink books is coming out next year. So there's a ton of stuff going on. Um, yeah. So, but but follow me on Twitter or Insta, and I'll be sure to keep you updated. Yeah. Okay. And we'll we'll definitely put uh, the links in the show notes for all of that. Um, Beautiful. Thank you. That's awesome, man. A hundred stories. I can't. <laughs> uh, it's it's weird actually to, to think in, in sort of retrospect, to be honest with you, because it, it doesn't seem mm -hmm. like too like long ago I was writing my first story, and now I'm a hundred hundred stories deep. It's it's kind of nuts, really. Um, and the, the, the issue I've got now is the challenge I've got now is like, do I go back to some of those early stories, those first 10 or 20 and, and, you know, sort of revamp them knowing what I know now, you know, with, with the skills I've got now. And, and I've actually done that for a couple and done it successfully. So, so, you know, the, the challenges for me is that I always want to write new stuff. I always want to move on to the next thing, but I also know there's like 10 or 20 stories back there that, that could do with a revamp and probably worth spending my time on and, uh, improving. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't want to. I don't want to tell you not to do that. I mean, so this is just my own opinion here, but it, yeah. I would be, I would think like you're a painter, so you just should keep painting new things. Sure. That thing that you painted a couple of years ago looks cool and could be better maybe, but don't go back and repaint it. Keep yeah, continuing, I know. evolving I know, yeah. and, and paint your paint. Your, but again, my opinion, I don't want to. No, that, that, that's one of, that's one of the voices in my head. Okay, no, okay. that's one of, that's one of the voices in my head. The other one is saying, <laughs> well, it, it could be better. You know, you've missed the trick there. You know, the, yeah. But, but anyway, yeah, I, I, to, to be honest, Brooks, I'll probably stick with, with that philosophy like you just, but I, I don't think, I don't think I can go back. I think I always have to keep moving forward. So yeah. no repainting anything, <laughs> no, re no touching up anything. No, not at all. No, <laughs> no, 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 no painting a big nose on the Mona Lisa or anything like that. No, I'll just, I'll there just focus on what's in front. Yeah. Make the smile a little bigger. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us tonight for this illuminating discussion on all the pitfalls of uh, harvesting human body parts. <laughs> and I, uh, I appreciate you for taking the time to sit down with us, Mark, and to share your world with us uh, here in the Gray Rooms. No, um, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, we're going to have you back again, so uh, <laughs> get ready for more. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have more coffee for the next one, Brooks. I'll, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be more alert for the next one, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, just stick it right into your vein. Just get that I will caffeine do. Yeah. straight. Right, I'll, st I'll start now. I'll start now.
Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and as usual, the biggest thanks goes out to our fans and followers who listen daily and spread the good word of Bob. Um, we are saving the deluxe suites on the top floor for when it's your time to visit the Grey Rooms. In the meanwhile, make sure to carry your umbrella with you at all times. You never know when it will start raining human ears. Um, on that note, take care, Mark, and uh, enjoy your night. Thanks, Brooks. You too. Thanks again. Thank you. And good night, folks. Bye. Join us each week after every episode for another edition of Behind the